Okay, um, I want to talk about non-violent direct action. And as a Green, actually, we believe in more than just electoral politics. We're also pride ourselves in being campaigning politicians. That's why you might see Caroline Lucas getting arrested at an anti-fracking demo. That's why you might see Jenny Jones being, getting arrested and then promptly de-arrested, maybe she's too important, for actually impeding the police at a demonstration in Parliament Square. So what is non-violent direct action? What does it mean and how does it work? I want to briefly look at three characteristics and there may be more. Firstly, non-violent direct action, this form of action, is active, not passive. My favourite example is probably Rosa Parks refusing to give up her seat on a bus in 1955 Alabama. That action helped inspire a civil rights movement. That was anything but passive, it was active. Against the backdrop of a racist society, her refusal, here I sit, I can do no other, that was highly consequential and intrinsically invaluable. Secondly, nonviolent direct action is intelligent. It's intelligence led, it's intelligence based. I don't think it's a form of nonviolent direct action. It's even violent in the first place. To throw a fire extinguisher off Millbank during a student protest, I don't think that does the protest any service whatsoever. Defacing public buildings, I don't think that really cuts it. Peter Tatchell confronting Robert Mugabe in Brussels. That was intelligent. Well, maybe it wasn't. There were the minders. They beat him up. But it was courageous. It was morally courageous. It was the courage of Peter Tatchell's conviction, and he helped highlight and remind people what Mugabe had, be, had been doing under his own regime. I was on a bus not so long ago, and I witnessed a boy being prevented from getting on the bus by police, so-called agents of the state. They were being violent. When the, bo when the boy eventually boarded the bus and the bus driver had the courtesy to wait for him, I asked, why were you stopped? He said, I'm black. This isn't 1955, this is 2014. That filled me with despair. Not so much that he was stopped and searched, and the statistics bear out that he was more likely to have been, but that he resigned himself to it. And injustice is all around. And that's why, as campaigning politicians, it's our duty to confront it wherever we find it. Thirdly, nonviolent direct action is a moral force for good. How does it really come about? If you see an unjust law, as a citizen, isn't it your duty to confront it? If you see your moral sensibility, being transgressed, and I don't just mean the poll tax looking after number one, I mean more significant things like the use of public space, like barricades being formed without due process, without good right citizenship reason. We have to confront those injustices. How does it really work then? Well, we often hear the refrain, the end doesn't justify the means. And in politics, it's actually quite important to have one eye and one mind on consequences. Doesn't Blair look incredibly harassed these days? Poor guy, he can't even launch a book without a protest on his doorstep. Exactly. How many people here marched against the Iraq war? Many of you. There was a slogan doing the rounds, not in my name. How come then we boasted even that we were going to bring the country to a standstill. We, the citizens, were going to bring the country to a standstill if our government, how dare they, go into Iraq. Now, that was a good proposition, if you ask me. Why didn't we act out on that? What's at the core of non-violent direct action is the means. The means is the ends in the making. And the end does not justify the means. Gandhi actually realized this. 
he speaks about the end, the value that you have in mind, somehow suffusing the way you approach that end. Think of justice, for example. Justice is both an outcome, it's an end, but it's also a means. How unconscionable it is to incarcerate people without charge or trial in Guantanamo. 12 plus years, many of them. For no good reason other than being in the wrong place at the wrong time. How can that produce a just outcome? It is itself unjust. Extraordinary rendition is an unjust method. Torture is not permissible. Not just because it's in violation of human rights law, but guess what? It's just inhuman. So these are all unjust means which cannot produce just outcomes. That, I think, is at the core of non-violent direct action. The means is the ends in the making. How does it actually impress upon the perpetrator of injustice? I think what it does, it forces that individual, compels them, not through physical force, it requires them to internalize what it is they're doing. And ultimately, I think, how this form of peaceable direct action works is it's saying, I can't physically stop you. You can overpower me, even as a police officer. You're the one with the toys. I can't physically um, overcome you. But what I can do, I can confront you in your head. I can get you, even as you're striking me, to realize that what you're doing has no rational or moral basis. And ultimately, I think the lesson of nonviolent direct action is that you can't get somebody to change their ways unless they change it themselves. And I think that's why it's such a powerful force for the good to be reckoned with. And finally, I put it to you that for those of you who were parading not in my name, I think as a form of non-violent direct action, I'm sorry, but that doesn't quite cut it. <laughs> Any questions? Yeah. I've got one and a half minutes. Yeah, I mean, I don't want to denigrate um, the power and the importance of mass mobilization as such. I'm just saying that I found it deeply disappointing that we didn't carry through with our promise. As, as Ben, the late Ben, has said, very pertinent, this is not a protest, it's a demand. We need to be active citizens. And if we really felt that strongly, if we're really going to weigh up the actual horrific violence that was being perpetrated by our heads of state in Iraq, bombs raining down on innocent children, do, don't you think it would have been proportionate for us even maybe to bring the country to a standstill, not to drive that train, not to go into work, risk losing our jobs? Yes, I think that would have been legitimate. If we'd all done it, safety in numbers, if you want to call it that. One more question? Yes. We have to choose our moments. The question was, can, we, can I see people getting that assertive? And my point is, is that we have to get more assertive because the disillusionment, rightly so, and the disempowerment people feel through democratic politics is such that we have to instigate politics all around, day by day, in our everyday business. And I'm at seven and a half minutes now, so over to Amelia. Thank you very much. So we briefly touched on Occupy and the fact that Jenny Jones got arrested there. When I was down at Occupy, I found it really interesting that you looked around and the entire movement was being run by young people. It was young faces. There were 40 people who were arrested. And when I went down to the Westminster Magistrate Courts to support them, I worked out the average age of those arrestees of being about 28. But why am I telling you about this? 
Because personally, I'm sick of people who say that young people aren't interested in politics. That I look around movements, such as the Stop the War movement, and I see young people at the front of it. I see 50,000 young people going on a demonstration to protect their right for free education. It was young people who were at the front of the, uh, the suffragette movement. It was young people who were there at the falling of the Berlin Wall. And it's young people that could cause an earthquake in the ballot boxes in the up upcoming general election. In the last general election, 44% of 18 to 24 year olds voted. 55% of 25 to 34 year olds voted. Yet, I look around and I see that young people are engaged in politics. They're engaging in petitioning, demonstrations, and Twitter storms saying Cameron must go. Their voices, yet, however, their voices are not being represented in Parliament because they're not going out and voting. That this current, um, this current government has been elected typically by the older generation and doesn't represent the voices of an entire group of people. I want to tell you a bit about why I'm deputy leader, because last summer I was a European candidate. Um, typically in Europe, you're young if you're under the age of 30. This changed to being young when you were under the age of 35. And this year, the reason, the definition of being young is in the European Parliament, you're underrepresented and you don't vote. This year, I was being invited to training events to support young people in politics for the under 40s. This isn't an apolitical generation. This is fast becoming a, a, a population who just aren't getting involved in electoral politics. One of, the main, one of the ways that you can get people engaged is to make sure that young people are represented in the highest form of politics. So I had been going out and getting uh, people under the age of 30 signed up to run for councils, signed up as parliamentary candidates, which um, I then got um, the young Greens turned around and said you should probably put your money where your mouth is and run for deputy leader. Um, so I was elected deputy leader running purely on the basis of talking about young people and politics at the age of 29. This is all of our duties. The younger generation, our generation, has been the generation that's experienced the brunt of the cuts. That one of the few economies, that's one of the few businesses, industries, that has um, been successful during this recession has been cruises for the over 60s. Yet, you've been looking at a generation who's taken the brunt of zero-hour contracts, whose education has gone up to extortionate amounts that to begin those very first steps in life when you're 18, you've got to begin that by making the choice of being in a lifetime of debt or not having the education. Let's face it, education should be a fundamental right, accessible for all, not just the very richest in society, not just those people who can take those risks of being in debt. Right now, 52% of homeless people are under the age of 25 due to changes in the benefit system that mean that there have been delays for this generation getting hold of their benefits. I find it really interesting because I went up to the Scotland for the Scottish um, referendum. Obviously, as you probably heard, they did pretty well with voter registration, getting young people out to vote. 80% of people voted, 80% of young people voted because they were given something to vote for. But what was interesting was when I went door to door and talked to people on the street, about why they were going to vote for the Yes campaign. They said, I don't want to live in a country where there are food banks. I don't want to live in a country where the NHS is being privatized beneath our noses. I don't want to live in a country where there are so many pu cuts to public services that there are strike there's strikes across the country to try and protect jobs. Jobs that are being blamed on the disappearance, immigrants are being blamed on the disappearance of when you can clearly see by the amount of strike action out there that it's not. It's the big businesses, it's the cuts in public services that are, be, that are to blame. And knocking on the door, if any of you have been out canvassing, um, knocking on the door in the rest of the UK, these are the exact same things I hear on the doorstep here. I want to appeal to you all. I want to appeal to you all because this generation needs a voice. Make sure that you're that we're getting people out registered to vote. The voter registration closes on the 20th of April. We need to be making sure that we're proving to young people that there's something to vote for. That if you're going out, if you're demonstrating, if you're signing petitions, if you want a voice in the future of your life, you've got to register to vote. And on the 7th of May, you've got to get out there and vote. 
tell your friends, tell your children, tell your grandchildren to get out there and register to vote and make sure that they're listened to. Because we need to, if every single young person went out and voted in this genera general election, they could cause an earthquake in the ballot boxes. They could practically decide what kind of um, parliament we have in the future. And let's face it, it would be very different from the one that we have now. Thank you.